Hello and welcome to Democracy Matters. This is a conversation series from the McDonald Laurier Institute. I'm joined today by uh, Jamie Kerchick, an author and journalist I respect so very much. Um, Jamie, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, we will start uh, a bit talking about your uh, new book, and then, of course, we're going to get into Ukraine and Putin and and much, much more. I'm so excited to be talking with you. Uh, tell us about your new book, Secret City. Secret City, the hidden history of gay Washington, uh, offers a completely new history of American national politics, high politics, if you will, mm -hmm. um, in our nation's capital from... Uh, I'd say the New Deal until the uh, end of the Cold War. Uh, and it tells the story through what was, during that period, the most dangerous secret you could have, which was being gay. It was worse mm -hmm. than even being a communist during the Cold War. Uh, and it created a real sense of palpable fear and hysteria uh, and intrigue in Washington. And the book uh, goes sequentially from the Roosevelt administration, from FDR, all the way to Bill Clinton, who lifted the ban on gay people receiving security clearances in 1995. Uh, and I think people will learn a lot from this book. It, it unveils um, a lot of secrets, obviously, that, that people didn't know before. And I hope we'll provide readers with a different way of looking at uh, American history. How long have you been researching it? Um, I know it's been very um, well received by people uh, like David Frum, and uh, many, many people are are uh, looking very forward to reading it. How long have you been working on it? Well, I came up with the idea probably almost 15 years ago. Um, I didn't really start working on it in earnest um, until maybe five or six years ago. Uh, so it's it's a book that's been really in development for a long, long time, and I'm very excited to share it with the world. Yeah, and so much in there I think that nobody knows or very, very few people know yeah. about. And uh, it's going to open up opportunities, hopefully, for understanding what's already come in American politics and hopefully open doors for many people um, in the future. Um Okay, so uh, I just finished uh, reading, or a few days ago, finished reading your book, uh, The End of Europe. And of course, I've been uh, reading your work and following your um, opinions uh, for years now. And I found the, the book, uh, The End of Europe, to be so prescient and uh, so, so relevant, obviously, to what's happening with Putin and the war uh, in Ukraine. Um, Given how much you um, understood the the dangers uh, years ago, uh, tell us first a bit about how you see the current context and if anything today surprises you, given how much you've been following the issues. Well, I was surprised that Putin actually launched a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Like most people, I didn't actually think he would do it, although... Um, in 2017, when that book came out, I wrote a piece for Foreign Policy magazine that was sort of a speculative fiction. It was imagining a kind of worst case scenario for Europe 2022. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Marine Le Pen becomes president of France and Jeremy Corbyn becomes prime minister of Britain. And the AFD, the far right party in Germany, rises to power there in coalition. Um, I had the Russians uh, invading Ukraine in that scenario and marching all the way to Kiev. Um, I didn't really think that that would actually happen. It was a worst case scenario. It was saying, you know, this is what might happen. But I uh, certainly, you know, six weeks ago, like most other commentators and observers, I didn't think Putin would actually go through with it. So that yeah. surprised me. Yeah. I'm also, frankly, surprised by the resistance that the Ukrainians have managed to put up. I think it's uh, inspiring, incredibly inspiring, and also, but also surprising, and not because I didn't think the Ukrainians would fight. I just didn't think that they would be, you know, numerous or powerful enough or organized enough. And I think a lot of us overestimated perhaps the um, the effectiveness, the lethality. Um, 
the the skill, the logistical capabilities of the Russian army. Uh, it's proven to be much weaker and uh, more disorganized than we had thought, uh, which is a good thing, obviously, um, which isn't to say that this is going to end well for Ukraine or the West. I think there are some very frightening scenarios that could develop mm -hmm. that lie beyond, you know, conventional military power, which we can get into. Yeah. Um, but it's certainly been a surprise that the Russian military has stalled and has reached this, this point where um, it, it's appearing like it might be some sort of stalemate. I mean, no one really can predict what will happen. Um, but, but, Certainly, most people would have assumed if the Russians did go through with this, then they would at least be able to execute a kind of quick decapitation strategy, which isn't to say that there wouldn't have been a you know resistance. Um, and, I, and I think no matter what happens, if if the Russians do uh, maintain their presence in Russia, there will always be some sort of U uh, U U Ukrainian resistance because these are these are people who are not going to be um, we're not going to go down without a fight. I think that's that's proven to be very clear. Yeah. Um, what about the uh, response so far from the West? Uh, how do you see it? What would you like to see happen that you haven't seen so far? Um, I think the response so far has been, um, it has been heartening in, in terms of the rapidity of, of, in, of um, bringing about economic sanctions. Um, but I think it's also been a little hyped. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, for instance, you know, Germany has received a lot of credit for kind of coming away from its aversion to sending military aid to Ukraine. They're finally doing that. Um, they're going to be rapidly or they're going to be dramatically increasing their defense budget um, to 2 percent, you know, which is the NATO recommended number, mm -hmm. um, something that President Trump was you know, berating them for years to do. They're now going to do it. But, you know, they still haven't decided to bring about uh, to enforce energy sanctions, um, which I think would be the most devastating economic weapon that Germany certainly has. And so in that sense, they are continuing to fund the war machine. Mm -hmm. I think the response from the United States um, has been, it seems, it seems that, that the White House is more insistent upon signaling what they won't do than what they will do or what they might do. And so there really isn't as much strategic ambiguity as there should be. Yeah. You have this constant messaging that we don't want to get into World War III, which is an old Soviet talking point, you know, that any sort of action that the West takes to defend itself or to respond to an act of aggression from the Soviet side would always be met with cries both from the Soviet Union and their supporters in Western countries. Right. So, um, that's their, so that's their disinformation to prevent a strong response. Right. To, to make us afraid, right? That anything we do would lead to World War III, that we would be responsible. Um, and it creates this sort of, es there's a term, you know, escalatory aversion, mm -hmm. which you're so afraid of escalating the situation that you allow your adversary to get away with anything. Um, so why do you think why do you think uh, uh, President Biden does talk so much about prevent you know preventing escalation, not protecting only NATO territory? Is that having to do with the ending endless wars and the 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 American aversion to to entanglements abroad, or is it really that his that his um, foreign policy team is a, is afraid of escalation, or or how do you see it? I think it's a. Well, I think it's both. I think that uh, we know Biden has been. You know, he, he was one of the earliest advocates for getting out of Afghanistan far earlier than President Obama. Um, he had never really had much hope for that for that mission. Um, I also think there's just sort of this ingrained um, belief among many people in the kind of Democratic Party foreign policy elite that um, Russia is a is a power that we can do business with. Mm. Um, that changed certainly during the Trump years when the Russians intervened on behalf of Trump and you saw this kind of rapid um, shift in rhetoric. Rhetoric, 
from the Democrats on Russia. But as we see in actual policy terms, you know, the minute Biden came into office, they lifted the sanctions on the Nord Stream pipeline. They halted some of the lethal weaponry that had been that was being sent to Ukraine under the Trump administration. So why you know, is Barack that? Obama when Barack Obama mm -hmm. was president mm -hmm. and the Russians annexed Crimea and started a war in eastern Ukraine, which has, by the mm -hmm. way, long, been going on for the past eight years. Uh, Obama refused to send lethal weaponry to Ukraine, too. Um, so there's a sort of deeply ingrained view on the kind of left of the foreign policy elite in this country um, that, you know, arming our allies in the middle of a war uh, or in the middle of a conflict with, with Russia is an escalatory step that we can't take and that we should be using other tools um, to stop Putin. Whereas I think now in the middle of a, of a war, the, the, the best way to, to uh, bring about a, a resolution that's favorable to us is to make the Russians bleed, uh, mm -hmm. to really make it cost them something beyond economics. I mean, it, it, the goal should be victory in Ukraine. Yeah. The goal should be, you know, lots of Russian body bags going home, lots of Russian tanks and planes being destroyed, really degrading the Russian military. And no one is calling for American, you know, we have to get out of this, um, you know, this rhetorical game that the Russians play. Okay? No one is advocating American soldiers be sent to die for Ukraine. Just give yeah. the Ukrainians what they need so they can fight and to defend not only their country, but to defend Europe and to defend the West. And so, so far, the things that the, the, the West and in particular the United States has delivered in terms of uh, weaponry you, you don't think is enough. I mean, Zelensky certainly doesn't think it's enough. Well, I don't. I, I agree with the with the calls for um, the hesitancy on a, on, on a no fly zone. I, I don't think that a total no fly zone is something that we should be advocating. But I don't see why we can't give the Ukrainians more effective anti aircraft batteries. Um, while we, why we can't give them Soviet era jets I mean, this whole dispute that occurred with Poland a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. I don't understand why that should, why, why the United States backfilling or delivering jets to Ukraine, that, why is that seen as provocative? You know, it's provocative, you know, invading a peaceful democratic country and trying to decapitate its leadership and kill its presidents. I mean, that's, what's provocative. It's worse than provocative. It's massive war crime and possibly genocidal. Um, so yes, we should be, do, we should be giving them more weaponry. We should be giving them more, um, uh, more, um, um, intelligence support. Mm -hmm. Uh, we should be opening up perhaps talking about humanitarian quarters, uh, and, and airlifts. I mean, we had an airlift to Berlin for over a year in the early, in 1949. I mean, those were, you know, Western planes, British, French, American planes every 90 seconds for a year. Okay, they were they were supplying West Berlin uh, mm -hmm. in the middle of East Germany. Okay, and the Russians didn't dare try to shoot down those planes. They knew what would have happened if they had done that. So why aren't we flying our planes to Kiev and supplying Kiev? Yeah, yeah. So maybe we should be talking about this airlift idea more than a no-fly zone. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, in terms of root causes, I mean, you talk about the root causes of where we are in terms of conflict in your book. Um, and I remember the last sentence of your book really kind of foreshadows a dark age. You even use the, that term dark age if things things really uh, turn turn downward for Europe, um, it, that that the repercussions are not just for that continent, but really for the whole world. So um, could you talk about some of those uh, deep causes that you already uh, wrote about several years ago and how you how you see them being um, uh, the manifest how you see their manifestation in the current war now? Well, I think this war is really a throwback to the worst years of the 20th century. Uh, we have uh, mm -hmm. an aggressive increasingly totalitarian, certainly undemocratic or authoritarian. It's, you know, verging on totalitarian at this point uh, regime, which is imperialist and expansionist, um, invading 
without any pretext or sorry, without, without, without any uh, justification, completely contrived, um, pointless war, uh, invasion of a peaceful, imperfect, but democratic country in Europe, laying waste to cities. Let's look at the drone footage of what Mariupol looks like. It looks like, you know, Stalingrad. Yeah. Uh, or, or uh, you know, other European cities during the worst years of the Second World War. Um, and this, I think, should have repercussions. And, and I think it reverberates. I think this is the reason why, you know, so many people in the around the world, not, not just in the West, but you see the demonstrations that are occurring all over the world. I mean, you saw the the statement that the Kenyan ambassador made mm -hmm. uh, at the United Nations. I mean, yeah. you know, Kenya is nowhere near this neighborhood, okay? But everyone, um, I mean, every, billions of people are looking at this and they can see what's very clear. Yeah. And it's very rare, I think, in world affairs that you have, you know, six, uh, kind of global conflicts between countries that are so clear cut, yeah, um, morally, and it's just it's really strikes a chord in people that this is just uh, this is wrong, uh, and it's 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 a bully, you know, picking on someone much smaller than them uh, for no reason other than their own, you know, malign justifications and purposes. Yeah, and it's really inspired um, a worldwide response, if not necessarily by you know, all the world's governments, which have their own, you know, reasons perhaps for not um, being so moralistic in their in their reactions and sort of the policy tools that they can use to respond to this, but certainly among um, our fellow human beings. I mean, there's just a real yeah. uh, conscience consciousness that this is just a dreadfully wrong and awful thing that's happening. Um, and the sympathy that people have for the Ukrainian people and the admiration that we have for them and what they are going through, I think is very inspiring. Um, but it does kind of serve as a reminder that if this does go the wrong way, it, yeah, it could take us into, you know, it could take us back to a very dark time. Okay. When might makes right. Okay. When there, when there are no, um, you know, peaceful means left to resolve conflicts between countries. Uh, when when you have larger countries basically just sort of, you know, overturning the table of um, the community of nations, say, and disrespecting the norms and values and the rules that we're supposed to abide by and just deciding, oh, I want that, it's mine, um, on one man's say, mm -hmm. uh, which is what's happened. And so I think, yeah, this matters. This is not just a small regional conflict. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a a global crisis, um, one in which, you know, everyone who cares about the future of democracy and human rights and human flourishing really has something at stake. How has the West and in particular Europe been complicit in getting Putin to this place where he thinks he can do something like this? Quite. I mean, you know, I think the reason why Putin thought he could get away with it is because he'd been allowed to get away with so much in the years leading up to this. Um, the man very likely came to power because he, uh, you know, blew up. He was involved as, as a as a as the prime minister at the time. You know, involved in in murdering yeah. hundreds of his fellow Russians in terrorist attacks and a false mm -hmm. flag attack, so that they could you know rally around the flag and use that as a means of uh, waging a war in Chechnya. So he mm -hmm. clearly has no regard for you know, his own fellow Russian citizens, yeah. life, let alone other people's lives. Uh, there's never really been a thorough, you know, U.S. government or Western accounting for that, for those incidents, the Moscow mm -hmm. apartment bombings. Yeah. Uh, and we sort of treated him like he was a legitimate leader. Remember President George W. Bush said he looked into his soul, right? Um, and then there was the speech he gave at the Munich Security Conference in 2007, where he basically declared war on the on the post-war liberal order. Mm -hmm. uh, the following year, there was the invasion and occupation of Georgia. Um, and then in 2014, there was the annexation of Crimea, which was the first armed 
annexation of territory on the European continent since World War II. Then there was the intervention in Syria, um, for which for which there was no consequence. I mean, you had the Obama administration predicting this would be Russia's, you know, Vietnam, or it would, it would be their Afghanistan again. And clearly that's not what happened. It was a successful mission from the stance of the Russians. They preserved Assad in power and they re-entered themselves into the Middle Eastern, uh, into the Middle East, which is a region that they had not had a military presence in since uh, the end of the Cold War. Mm. Um, so there's a series of, and that's, nothing to say for all the other crimes he committed against his own people and abroad. I mean, murdering dissidents yes. overseas uh, in Britain using, you know, chemical, uh, you know, poisons, uh, very dangerous. How about the complicity of the West in terms of the corruption of his oligarchs? How much do you The oligarch class that only now mm -hmm. belatedly are we seizing these yachts? It's not like we all knew you know the, the the authorities in these western countries they knew when, you know where this money was being parked and they knew who these yachts belonged to in these you know mansions on the riviera it's not like you know uh alexei navalny and other sort of anti-corruption activists and researchers weren't you know alerting our leaders about these yeah uh, we knew you know people like gerhard schroeder the former chancellor of germany i mean we we know about the former uh european politicians who are on the kremlin payroll we know about or even current politicians right or even current politicians and political parties across the western world being funded by russian government money or um russian interventions into our democratic um processes uh we've known all about this and the russians have basically been able to get away with it for mm -hmm. and putin's so putin, this is a more than two decade long i mean the man came to power in 2000 New Year's Day, 2000. He's been in power for over two decades. Um, and he's been, been effectively been able to get away with this increasingly malign and aggressive behavior. Um, so I can understand why he perhaps thought that he might be able to, you know, if not tactically on the ground in Ukraine, um, certainly why he thought he might be able to get away with, you know, chewing off more mm -hmm. yeah. um, than he had so far. In terms of solutions and moving moving towards the future, how much faith do you have in the opposition inside of Russia to to overthrow Putin and to to herald a new a new uh, era in Russia, uh, or are there other solutions? I mean, ultimately, what how do we uh, stop him from doing more? I mean, I, I, it seems like NATO is preparing for potential. Uh, offensive attacks from Putin on NATO territory, uh, something Zelensky has warned that that he would likely do. Wh where do you see the solutions now? Um, I think he needs, the, the, the regime needs to feel pain and it needs to feel pain in the economic sector. And it's, you know, it's unfortunate that average Russian citizens uh, will have to suffer because of this. But you know mm -hmm. what? Uh, Ukrainian civilians are suffering a lot more um, and this is one of the only tools, the nonviolent tools that we that that we have. Yeah. Um, the costs of what he's doing in Ukraine need to be much higher, right? There need to be more body bags going back. We need Russian soldiers perhaps being convinced uh, this is not a fight that's worth their lives. Okay, they need to maybe they need to be convinced. Put down your weapons, surrender. Mm -hmm. You will be you will be treated humanely. Okay, you will not be treated like. Uh, Russia treats prisoners of war. Right. Uh, you will be treated humanely. Um, we want to see more defections yeah. from just the level of, of the everyday conscript in the military, but all the way up to the top of the Kremlin. Right. Uh, and they need to feel the pain as well. You know, no more Western bank accounts, no more sons and daughters of whether oligarchs or Kremlin officials or anyone complicit in this regime, you know, enjoying the benefits of Western societies. They can't be going to you know, elite Western schools. Um, they they cannot be. Uh, they should their visas should be withdrawn. Yeah. Um, we need to do all that we can to isolate him, um, and make it so that the forces within Russian society, to the extent that they can, can lead to hopefully a, a bloodless you know coup. I mean, we don't we don't want 
um, a civil war or any kind of domestic violently violent power struggle in in Russia. That's not what we want. But I do think um, uh, regime change should be the goal, yeah. um, not by invading Moscow and overthrowing Vladimir Putin. Of course, we're not talking about that. But clearly, the Putin regime itself is the problem. Right. Um, it is the problem. It is the sole problem. It is nothing that we have done. Okay. It is not NATO enlargement. It is not um, EU enlargement. Okay. It is not um, offering a trade package and an aid package to Ukraine so that they can move closer to the West. Those enticements have also existed for Russia. There's nothing stopping mm -hmm. Russia from also moving closer to the West. Um, what they should not be allowed to do is to use coercion to um, try to force sovereign countries um, against making what ought to be sovereign foreign policy decisions. Yeah. Um, there is a, a strand on the right wing of the United States and uh, other, other Western countries that uh, doesn't want to support the Ukrainians and um, and um, is even following the Russian disinformation line about uh, Russians being um, Nazis and uh, you Ukrainians know, being Nazis. Yeah. I'm sorry, yeah, Ukrainians being Nazis. How do you how do you see that? What are the what are the roots of that? You wrote about it in your in your book on the end of Europe. You've written about it uh, recently in Tablet Magazine when. Um, uh, for example, when you've talked about the uh, Iranian American intellectual Sohrab Ahmadi, um, how important are they? And do you see them as a rising phenomenon, or in general, also how how important is Russian disinformation's uh, uh, ability to permeate in, into the West? So I think that this sort of strain of American right wing isolationism has always existed, it's always been there. Um, it's become perhaps louder because of the internet and you know, there's one particular host on Fox News who's very, who has you know the highest ratings on cable news. We're still talking about someone with an audience of 3 million people out of a country of 330 million people. And if you actually look at the composition of the votes in Congress, mm -hmm. the US Congress, the Senate and the House, you find almost unanimous support for Ukraine. Yeah across the partisan lines. I mean, the vast majority of Republicans are um, standing with their Democratic colleagues and supporting Ukraine and in favor of sanctioning Russia. Right. Um, so I think this, this kind of neo-isolationist sentiment on the right, you're finding, yes, there are prominent voices in the media and in sort of intellectual circles. Um, and they have, you know, they make a lot of noise on Twitter um, they have new intellectual organs, right? Yeah. Websites, podcasts, right? Magazines. Yes. Um, I don't really. I think at the end of the day, you know, the the American people are fundamentally, you know, Jacksonian in their mm -hmm. foreign policy outlook, um, which means they're not isolationist. They're not. They're not Wilsonians, right? They're not. We don't want to go around basically telling the world how to run its affairs, mm -hmm. but we also don't like bullies. Yeah. Um, and we believe in the sovereignty of, of individual countries. Mm -hmm. And I think you just look at the polls of the American public and it's just overwhelming support for Ukraine. The average American doesn't really need to um, spend a lot of time studying what's happening yes. in Russia and Ukraine to instinctively understand who's the bad guy and who's the good guy here at the Absolutely. end of the day. And I think that's that's really come through. Um, you see it just in the outpouring of support um, in cities, you know, public demonstrations and the the charity that's being uh, the money that's being raised through charities to help Ukrainian refugees. And we just know, we see it in our everyday lives, the people that we talk to, people who aren't really necessarily politically aware, don't really care about politics that much. It's really awakened yeah. something, I think, yeah. among people in democratic countries that this is fundamentally wrong. It's wrong. Um, is it, is it, it resisted? Yeah. Have we been asleep to some extent about our own democratic values? Has, the, has this been a wake up? Well, I think, you know, I, I can only speak to my experience in the United States here. And I think we've had, you know, during the Trump years, we had such um, bitterness and division and partisanship 
Um, and we were very kind of navel gazing. Mm -hmm. um, and the quality of the political conversation just really sunk into ad hominem and kind of knee jerk reactions. And I think that also explains a bit also, you know, of this kind of this element of the American right that has become mm -hmm. pro-Russian. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of it is just sort of negative partisanship. It's they, yeah. they see the, well, there's a Democrat in the white house and he's supporting Ukraine. We therefore it's like this knee jerk contrarianism, you know, we're right. going to become more pro-Russian just because we don't like what that guy thinks. And so the mm -hmm. enemy of my enemy is my friend. It really mm -hmm. boils down to that. Um, but I think because of the smallness of our debates in America over the past couple of years, we've been arguing about, you know, transgender bathrooms and, you know, critical race theory in public yeah. schools and, uh, you know, what pronouns we use in our Twitter profiles and just, you know, things that are, uh, I'm not, I'm not trying to downplay the importance of these topics, but they're not really anything compared to what's going on in Ukraine right now. Absolutely. Right? You know, these kind of free speech controversies on university campuses over, you know, things that are considered offensive and yeah. the equation of, you know, um, language with violence, right? Yeah. Certain words are the equivalent of violence. Um, and, you know, the actual violence, you know, we're seeing what actual violence is, you know, actual violence, mm -hmm. Uh, are uh, the leveling of apartment, the whole whole cities, okay, of, of apartment buildings or uh, a theater that's housing women and children and just being blown up from the sky. That's real horrific violence. And I think this has served as a reminder um, that however difficult life has become in Western societies and whatever mm -hmm. our own kind of domestic political disagreements that we have as Republicans and Democrats, um, at the end of the day, we really do need to understand that uh, there are fundamental values that we should all be able to agree on. And it's Ukraine right now that is standing up for those. Yes. Yes. So um, talking about uh, the Trump era, there are some people who believe that um, if Trump was president, Putin wouldn't have dared to do what he's doing. What do you think about that? Uh, it's obviously a counterfactual. Um, I think it's a mixed bag because there were certain, you know, on, on some matters, the Trump administration, if not President Trump himself, uh, the Trump administration was tough on Russia. Yeah. You know, they, they did place sanctions on Nord Stream 2. They did increase our military presence in Eastern Europe in defense of our NATO allies. Yeah. They did successfully get... NATO allies to commit more money to the alliance, to their own collective or yeah. collective defense. Yeah. The Trump administration, uh, President Trump himself ordered strikes on Russian mercenaries in Syria, killing over a hundred of them. Um, there were harsh sanctions on Russia taken in 2017 for what they did during the 2016 election. Yeah. Even if Donald Trump was on the one hand publicly denying that the Russians assisted him, the Trump administration was implementing very tough sanctions, expelling diplomats, diplomats um, from, you know, from diplomatic posts, you know, shutting down the consulate in San Francisco, which was being used for espionage purposes. So there's a whole slew of policy actions that the Trump administration took, which were strong on, on Russia. And there was a broader sort of foreign policy that the Trump administration implemented. Um, that perhaps created some strategic ambiguities yes. and maybe planted in Putin's mind that Trump was an unpredictable actor um, and that he was like a bear that if you poked him would respond, you know, in, uh, aggressively. And, 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 perhaps, that, and, perhaps, yeah, and, and perhaps that did inhibit Putin from doing what he's doing now in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there were many other actions that I could say might have led Putin to believe that he might be able to get away with something for, you know, the whole, the whole cause of the first impeachment of Trump, this attempt to, you know, kind of extort the Ukrainian government uh, to get information on the Bidens in exchange for military aid that might have sent a message to Putin. Look, Trump really doesn't care fundamentally in terms of, you know, values, strategy, yeah. doesn't really care about Ukraine. He cares about his own political future more than anything else. 
And the fact that he's willing to play a game and the fact that he's willing to hold up military support to this country, to Ukraine, um, over a domestic political dispute indicates to me that his heart's not really in it. And that if I were to push further in Ukraine, I might be able to get away with it, right? Mm -hmm. Similarly, the, the attempts, um, when, when Trump would say things like if NATO doesn't, you know, if NATO members don't meet the 2% commitments, we might not honor Article 5. We might not honor the collective defense uh, clause of the NATO charter. Yeah, That also sends a terrible message uh, when you're trying to deter an adversary. So I think it's a mixed bag. Uh, and I think anyone who says, you know, yes or no, one way or the other, that, you know, absolutely, if Trump were still president, Putin would not be doing this. Mm -hmm. Or anyone who says, no, it's obvious that Trump was, you know, he was a Russian spy from the beginning. And I think anyone who who is arguing with such, um, you know, firmness and conviction on a question that fundamentally cannot be answered, right. I think they don't know what they're talking about. And I think you have to be humble about this and, and you know, express some humility. And that's what I've tried to do. I've tried to give you both sides of the ledger here. Um, and I think it's not entirely clear what Putin would have done. That's very useful. He wanted to do what he's doing now. I think it's clear that this is something that's been brewing in him for many, many years. He's never believed that Ukraine is really a country. Yeah. Um, and this is a fundamental belief that he has, regardless yeah. of who's president, regardless of who's president of the, of the yeah. United States. And he always believed really that the that the democratic revolution of Ukraine was our making, was the CIA's yes. making, right? He fundamentally believes that. And that has nothing to do with who's president. Because he doesn't really believe right. that America is really democracy. He thinks that they're, you know, he he also believes in this sort of permanent deep state, okay, mm -hmm. that really is running the show. Yeah. Um um, uh, so I think it's, yeah, I think, I think he, he, he wanted to do what he's been doing for a long time. Um, and I don't, and, and I don't think he would have allowed, uh, whoever was in the white house to necessarily get in the way of him ultimately accomplishing what he wants to accomplish. Yeah. So there are a lot of parallels here to how the, uh, Islamic Republic, Iran's regime thinks about America, the deep state that you talked about. And I think China too, the Chinese Communist Party, um, in the last conversation that I had here on Democracy Matters with Eli Lake, uh, he made the point in all kinds of ways and dimensions that uh, Chinese Communist Party, Putin's regime and the Islamic Republic really should be treated as one um, uh, alliance or axis. And if we really want to defeat one, we have to take them all on at the same time. To, to, to what extent do you agree? And uh, how do you recommend that the, the free world counter them? Well, I do believe that, yes, these, these three countries, like, and it's not just limited to them. I would put Venezuela in there. I would put even little yeah. Nicaragua and Cuba in there. You know, these are countries that don't believe in individual human rights. Um, they are all authoritarian in some degree. Um, they are all massively corrupt. Um, they don't allow for, um, you know, democratic processes to take place. These are, these are regimes that believe in their inherent right to rule, uh, in perpetuity forever. Um, and so they all, and they also don't believe in the sovereignty of, uh, their neighbors or other other nations, they don't respect the the the, the sovereignty of, the, of those of those countries. They have imperialistic ambitions, not necessarily Nicaragua or Venezuela, but certainly China, Iran, and Russia. Yeah. All have um, a revisionist approach to the international system, which is very important. You know, they are not content with the settled situation. So, you know, China obviously one day hopes to reintegrate in their terms or reunify um, mm -hmm. Taiwan. Uh, Russia has made it very clear what their views are towards the sovereignty of its neighbor, Ukraine. Um, and Iran wants to dominate its neighbors and install puppet regimes across the region. Um, so that is a fundamental uh, uh, commonality between yeah. these regimes. And there may be fissures between them. They're not always going to agree on everything. I mean, clearly the Chinese don't want to be associated with what the Russians are doing in Ukraine right now. I think they've been frightened by this. Um, it's it's proven to them that when the West when the West 
you know, can get its act, it can get its act together in, in responding to something and it can really economically hurt a country. You get, you, you get the most powerful economies in the world together, you know, united on a sanctions package like this, they can cause serious damage to, to a country. And I think that has definitely spooked, um, mm -hmm. The, the the uh Chinese and they don't want to be seen as supporting they, they they've abstained at the United Nations on on the votes condemning Russia but they certainly don't want to be seen as party to this yeah yeah it's a sinking ship in their eyes probably they don't yeah. they don't gain anything from it uh, what are you what do you think are the best ways that uh that we can counter them the the free world Western nations how best do we do we counter them? Well, I think um, drawing very clear red lines and making sure that those red lines are not crossed is very important. Um, when Barack Obama declared that there was a red line in Syria on the use of chemical weapons and then chemical weapons were used and then didn't enforce it, even worse, when he you know, conceded to this um, ridiculous Russian plan that you know they would come in and allow for inspections of Syrian chemical weapons, um, and then have those chemical weapons removed. And then the Obama administration assented to that and went along with it. And it's clear that not all the chemical weapons were removed because Assad used them again. So you have these repeated violations of red lines and you're re repeatedly allowing these regimes to cross them. Um, or, or perhaps um, not being clear enough um, about about these about these red lines, I think you encourage mm -hmm. them, and I think weakness is provocative. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the red lines need to be more sharply drawn. Um, I think we need, and I, I think that is really the main the main thing. And I think that's why what's happening in Ukraine right now is so important because if the Ukrainians are able to, and the West more broadly are able to hold off um, a Russian uh, coup, mm -hmm. uh, and are basically able to prevent the Russians from achieving what they have been trying to achieve, I think it'll send a very strong message to the Iranians and the Chinese and really all authoritarian leaders that um, their plans will be stymied and that the, you know, the, the, the free world to the extent that it exists um, is, is capable of standing up for its values. Yeah, so you, you, it seems like you don't see weakness in the Biden posture. Um, well, no, I mean, I don't think we're sending, I, I don't think we're doing enough mm -hmm. on um, sending military aid to Ukraine. Uh, I also think the, yeah. this pursuit of a, of a nuclear deal with the Iranians using the Russians as broker exactly. in the middle of this, I think absolutely demonstrates weakness while, while the Iranians are involved in continuing to support terrorism across, across the region. Um, what explains it? What do you why why do you think that uh, this the, the Obama Biden playbook on Iran is the way it is? They just have a different vision of what the Middle East should be. They don't they don't want to support the security architecture that the United States has had in that yeah. region of the world, yeah. which is based upon our alliance with Israel and the Sunni Arab. Uh, states, the Gulf mm -hmm. Kingdoms, the Gulf Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Jordan, um, containing or, or, you know, grouped in an alliance against Iranian aggression. They want to basically remove ourselves and, and realign the United States so that it's kind of a neutral broker. Uh, and it's basically empowering Iran. And I have no problem with an empowering a democratic Iran. I don't <laughs> think a democratic Iran would threaten anybody. Yeah. Um, but certainly not this regime. I mean, this this regime wants to establish dominance across the region, which is why you're seeing yeah. bodies distance themselves from the Biden administration. Yeah. Now they're talking about, you know, um, selling oil to the Chinese in in, in, um, mm -hmm. in Chinese currency. And, and not answering Biden's phone calls. Leaders of the UAE are, you know, mm -hmm. also not are also not answering the president of the United States' phone calls. I mm -hmm. mean. So and, and, you know, and this this policy, how much does it prevent um, a democratic Iran from emerging? How harmful is the is the lack of pressure on the the foreign belligerents? I mean, here here there's a parallel to to Russia. That how strongly we confront um, the regime when it's uh, expansionist and imperialist 
has something to do with how empowered the Democrats inside the country feel, right? Yeah. And I think anything that, you know, I think giving the Iranians billions of dollars in sanctions relief, and that's money that will go into fueling domestic repression and foreign adventurism and, and foreign terrorism. Uh, I think that's extremely disheartening if you're an Iranian Democrat. Um, and I think it strengthens the hand of, of the mullahs. So I don't... Um, and you think this is because America wants America under the the, the Obama Biden Middle East playbook wants to be a neutral arbiter between these countries? Yeah, I think the United States doesn't um, want to be you know dragged down um, in the Middle East anymore. It wants to basically yeah. you know pivot to Asia, right, or reduce our dependence on Middle Eastern oil, which is a fine. That's that's a fine goal, but to do that, you need to you know increase your domestic production, which is something that the Obama, so the the well, the Obama and the Biden administration are loath to do, yeah, um, because they're you know captive to a uh, environmental lobby in this country, um, uh, which mm -hmm. would also, by the way, help us in our dealings with the Russians if we increased our domestic yeah. production. We wouldn't, we, yeah. we could be able to supply more to our allies who are mm -hmm. more far more dependent on on Russian gas and oil than we are. We have, we have, we don't import any of it practically. Um, so so energy want... policy, energy policy here at home can be one of our biggest uh, weapons against these regimes. No, we absolutely need to, you know, unleash um, domestic um, gas and oil exploration, production, fracking, the whole, the whole works and, you know, the cleaner alternatives as well, but we need to be less dependent on, uh, regimes like Iran and Russia and Venezuela. Um, I, th I think that that should be clear. Yeah. Okay. Jamie Kirchick, thank you so much for uh, giving us your time today. It was fantastic. I look so forward to reading your new book, Secret City. Thank you again for being with us. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you.